Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for listening. I, I'm curious, where do you listen from? Like, wh where do you live? I don't know where you found me on social media. I'm not sure how you found my podcast, but uh, who are you? Where do you live? How did you find out about me? Um, what's your life like? I'm curious. I'd love to know who you are. So uh, I can you can hear me, but I can never hear you unless you like reach out on social media and tell me. So uh, the best places to find me, Facebook, Rob Z Radio. All right, so if you go to Facebook or Instagram, Rob Z Radio, or go to Twitter, which is Rob Z Yo. Uh, my Snapchat is also Rob Z Yo. Message me on any of those platforms and just be like, hey, this is my name. This is where I found out, out about you. Uh, here's a little bit about myself. I would love to find out. I'd love to know who's listening. Uh, and also, there's an awesome new platform called Patreon. So Patreon allows artists to make money off of their passions. Uh, and it's all from the people who enjoy the artists. So if you enjoy what I do and you have a few extra dollars and you're feeling giving, you're feeling that in your heart to give to somebody, please, <laughs> please give to me. I don't want to sound desperate or anything um but you go to patreon.com forward slash rob z radio so whether you're an artist maybe you're a musician maybe you're a podcast host i don't know what you do in your spare time patreon.com is the website p-a-t-r-e-o-n patreon.com forward slash rob z radio and you can help me out and I'm, all i'm asking for is a dollar and if you give me that dollar i will give you a personal phone call uh just to find out what you're all about and it's kind of a reciprocity that's a big word i'm not very good at those but i actually nailed that one i'm very surprised right now from episode 353 i've got kenny dodson in the studio and let's do a random question generator what did you want to be whenever you grew up whenever you were a kid what was it that you wanted to be me <laughs> no i'm dead serious you like are, I, you? I didn't yeah but i i actually only lived in the moment, never really thought about the future at all. I didn't have a profession. I didn't want to be a fireman. I didn't want to be a policeman. I didn't want to be an astronaut. You know, I, I just didn't. I just wanted to be. And that's it. That's and, so cool. Yeah. So like I said, it wasn't until eighth grade that I really knew I wanted to be an editor. I, I was waiting for something to act upon me, I guess. So when somebody a, would ask you like, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're like, I just, I'm already here. Yep. You're looking at it, dude. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know. You know, I, I just for like I maybe I can't remember what I thought, but but when I look back, I didn't ever have an aspiration. That's wild. Mm -hmm. For me, it was professional wrestler and radio DJ. Seriously? So yeah, it was <laughs> a pro wrestler and then a radio radio DJ. Sometimes you just gotta <laughs> let life tell you. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting though, man. So you basically just said you know to yourself, and I guess you found your path there through all of that. But I'm was that like a a metaphor for bettering yourself, do you think? Or like, like, I'm already who I am, I just want to be me and continue to be me. No, because back then I was very full of myself oh, okay. and a very different person than oh. who I am today. Um, believe it or not, you know, becoming unhealthy can be a good thing Yeah. to, to a certain extent. Uh, I started having seizures whenever I was in high school and I went from feeling like I was better than everybody else to... I was one of everybody else, mm. and I started switching my perspective at that point Wow! when I was 17, or 15, 16, yeah. Like a wake-up call. Very much, like very much like a wake-up call. So I, I thought being me was the best thing that could be, and, you know, it, it took my brain to tell me, no, that's not true. Very cool, man. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome answer. Episode 353 of the podcast with Kenny Dodson. <laughs> Kenny's awesome. So uh, he actually introduced me to Patty A. Wilson, who's on the podcast today. Go back and check that podcast out with Kenny because it is fantastic. He's a Hollywood film editor, and he started the show in Pennsylvania called The PA Traveler. Listen to that episode. It's really cool. Uh, but today, uh, this is really cool because I've always, I love the paranormal. I've always wanted to have a paranormal expert, which I believe Patty A. Wilson is on the show, and she's here. She's written more than 23 books about the paranormal. Uh, starting with Haunted Pennsylvania, and she's wrote Cursed in Pennsylvania, written, I'm sorry, Cursed in the Carolinas. Miss <laughs> Wilson has explored the darker side <laughs> of the paranormal. Uh, she's appeared on Mysterious Journeys on the Travel Channel, My Ghost Story on Biography, uh, the Biography Channel, and other television shows, news articles, 
Uh, she works in the field of psychiatry and resides in Bedford, Pennsylvania. I'm so excited to have her on here. New projects are on the way from her as well. You can reach her at pineycreekpress at yahoo.com or her paranormal Facebook page, which is called The Paranormal Asylum. <laughs> and she's going to be our guest today. Before we get there, though, we got a shout out to the wonderful sponsors like the Clay Cup who make this podcast boss- possible. Did I want to say possible? Because that's not a word. Uh, the Clay Cup, Facebook and Instagram, at the Clay Cup, 1304 11th Avenue in Altoona. Coffee, tea, and creativity. Pottery, painting, watercolor classes, all of that at the Clay Cup. Shout out to Juice. That's J O O S. Juice, 517 Allegheny Street in Hollidaysburg, at the Juice Bar on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, cold pressed juice and smoothies, smoothie bowls, bone broth. All fresh, made to order, delicious stuff to make your body feel good on the inside. Right there in the belly, I see it. And also a shout out to Harlequin Pepper Yoga. I love yoga. I love what Aaron does at HPY. That's the acronym for Harlequin Pepper Yoga. 320 Allegheny Street in Hollidaysburg, PA. So check it out. If you find Harlequin Pepper Yoga on the App Store, if you find it on Google Play, or you walk in to Harlequin Pepper Yoga and you say the words Rob Z, use the code word. Rob Z, get one month free toward a six month or a year membership at Harlequin Pepper Yoga. Vinyasa yoga rooted in science, focusing on functional movement and anatomical alignment. And now, my friends, it's time to get into the show with Patty A. Wilson. It's time to get paranormal. I'm so excited. This is Rob Z Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Patty Wilson is here. Patty, thank you for being here today. Oh, thanks for having me. This is going to be exciting. I'm really excited. I have not, I've never had anybody uh, who works in the paranormal before on the podcast. I've had some strange people who may, <laughs> you may have thought of be in the paranormal world, but they were not. But uh, I, I had talked to Kenny Dodson, just the PA traveler, just recently had him on here, and he said that I had to talk to you. I had to find out what you did and uh, and and promote what you do also on the podcast. So uh, you're from Bedford, Pennsylvania. Yes, that's where I live. And I, I guess you could do it better than I would. Let the people out there know who you are and and what you've been doing for the past 17 years. Okay. Well, my name is Patty A. Wilson, and I started out by writing a collection of ghost stories. They were all true stories, historically accurate and or personal first-person accounts. And that led to um, 23 books to date, and I ended up becoming a paranormal researcher. I've worked and taught at Rhine Research Center in Durham, North Carolina. I have also taught at Lilydale which is the oldest spiritualist community in the world. So I've been at it for quite a while. Wow. You started with books. Started with books. That's where it books. began. So how did this all begin? And we'll get to a bunch of other. I have so many different questions. I'm just going to start there. How did it begin for you uh, in the paranormal book world? Well, um, I've always loved ghost stories. I, as I said, I'm a little sensitive, so I've always kind of dealt with the paranormal in some fashion, and I love to write. So I wrote this collection of ghost stories, starting with my family stories and moving outward to stories from all over Pennsylvania. And the second publisher purchased it, and then the letters started to come in from fans and people who needed help. You said you were a little sensitive. What does that mean? I mean... I think a lot of people would understand towards like energy. Some people can understand people's energy better or feel something more than somebody else would be able to. What was that like for you, that sensitivity that knew that let you know that you had something different? Well, I didn't actually know it was different because I always had it. So I kind of grew up thinking everybody was that way, that you could see and hear stuff. And then as I got a little older, my mom would say, you know, Patty, you can't talk about that. You can't say that because it isn't normal. That's the introduction to why you kept it quiet. Right. And then, um, you know, you just kind of quietly went along with it from that point forward. And But it was always there, you know, having experiences, seeing things, hearing these things, talking to you, and then realizing there's they were people and they had something they needed help with but it was a quiet thing for many many years when did it first start bef- like before you ever said anything to anybody when did it first start for you like what age i honestly can't answer that um or like i, I guess I zero to five five i would to ten. say maybe the first time i was really aware of it 
um, I was always told not to talk about things because you know you would say something and mom would say that's that's something you don't tell anybody else. That's something you talk to your mom and grandma about. But uh, at the age of ten, probably was when my two of my grand my two grandfathers passed away, oh, okay. and one of them I saw. Now, I bring that up because whenever I was a kid, and I don't remember this. My mom has told me many of times that I, I used to do this. So in our old house, a, a lady, an older lady, elderly lady had died in, in our house. And uh, we'd be watching TV, you know, and I was, I don't know, three, four, maybe five. I'm not real sure exactly how old I was. Somewhere in that span. And I'd be like, hey, mom, there goes that lady up the steps again. Or I would say just something. Right along those lines at different points in the house at different times. Uh, I even remember one time being really little and uh, being in my room, my bedroom, and it was like a dream, but it was like I was awake and my bed was like flying around the room. I don't know what that meant. If, I don't think anybody was picking my bed up, but I think it was some sort of, it was something. Uh, so at a young age, and I, I do remember that moment of, of like flying around in my bedroom. Um, so I've always believed right i i just had i was talking to somebody the other day and i said about you coming on they're like do you really believe in ghosts and i was like well but yeah i mean there's, there's something i don't know what they are but i know there's there's something right. there's been enough of it out there that there's got to be uh, something going on so i just wanted to let you know that i had a little i've had experience with that myself and uh, at a young age is when it usually happens, right? Isn't that normally... It usually, if it's going to start for you as a child, yeah, it's usually like two, three, four years old, people will start talking about things. I hear a ton of those stories. Um, and then sometimes people grow out of it, mm -hmm. and sometimes they grow into it, depending on the person. I think I grew out of it because it doesn't happen to me anymore. Or there's just no ghosts around me. I'm not Either sure what's that, going or, on. You know, we learn <laughs> to tune it all out as time goes on. Okay. But um, I will tell you that having worked with a lot of people in the paranormal, that people who had that ability when they were little, if they start working in the paranormal on a more or less regular basis, a lot of times it'll become more sensitive and then yeah. it'll start up again for them. Is that how it was for you? Like the more you dug into it, the more intense it got or the more sensitivity you had? Yes, in a lot of respects, but I still kept it very quiet. In fact, um, it was only about 10 years ago that Mark Nesbitt, the historian and author, is a good friend and a co-writer, him and his wife figured it out, and he basically outed me on um, public radio. He just literally, like, blew it and told everybody that I was that way, and it made me very frightened because I'd spent a lifetime not telling anyone. But you had written books. But the books are different. They're all about the history. They're about research. They're about oh. documenting it. So it's not about, it's not your name attached to it. It's not, it wasn't about me. These were stories of other people. Oh, okay. So your name was on the books, but it was about other people's yes. ghost experiences. Wow. Okay. So that's that's wild that you kept it hidden for that long. What was the reason? Do you think just because your parents told you that when you were young? Yeah, you because thought... I was I was always schooled to be quiet about it and to feel uncomfortable with it. So I was, and then. We were actually in Greensburg, Mark and Carol and I, and we were at an old hotel, and they had brought a lady in who said she was a psychic, and she is sitting there telling these people, oh, the, the, the man who built this hotel was so proud of you because, you know, you're keeping it open and you're running it, which she was talking to the daughter-in-law of this man, and the whole time that she's telling this wonderful tale about how this man loved his daughter-in-law and all of this, I'm standing there and I'm listening to this and I'm watching the guy and he's saying terrible things about the daughter-in-law about how he didn't like her and he was dressed very funny in a particular way and all of this and finally after like an hour of listening to this lady go on and on I I guess just couldn't take it anymore and I leaned over and I said to Carol Nesbitt I said you know this woman's full of it because that guy hated his his, his daughter-in-law <laughs> and Carol rolled around and looked at me and she said what did you say and I said he hates his daughter-in-law and at that moment, Carol goes, you can see him. And I'm like. Because <laughs> she knew the truth. <laughs> she knew the story. And the story was that he did hate his daughter-in-law. And he had kind of gone a little dotty and was dressed in like a Hugh Hefner smoking jacket and would run around with his little dog and oh, his okay. slippers. And, and that's what I was describing to her. And she's like, okay, we're going to have a talk about this. And then it was, uh, I think I went to three or four sites with them quietly. And they made me, you know, kind of do what. I should have been doing, I guess, all along. And then at that point, we did a radio show, Mark and I, for one of our books, and Mark just kind of let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no turning back. But I'm really grateful. So, okay, you're you're there, and they're the, they're talking about how much the uh, the daughter-in-law was loved by this man, yes. and the man's in front of you. So, <laughs> this this is so wild. 
how do you distinguish him from everybody else? Or is it obvious that it's he is? It's obvious to me that he's not alive, it, that I'm just seeing him. Is and he like fully formed, like fully clear? Or what, what does it look like? He was fully formed. I mean, they come in different ways. They, they communicate in different ways, too. Um, some of them will show you pictures. Some of them will talk to you. Some of them will be, you know, three-dimensional and just as real. But I can still, I mean, I still know, obviously, they're not alive human beings. And I'm, I'm just sitting there trying very hard to keep my mouth shut and look down and ignore all of this because I know the lady's wrong. And finally, I'd had enough and I didn't think about it. I just blurted something out. So when, when, when people picture ghosts or in their head or however that might mm -hmm. be, um, I guess a bunch of different images pop into your mind. So you're saying for each person or each spirit or whatever it is that comes into that you can see or you can uh, communicate with, they always look in a different form. Like they don't, they're not like just people or sometimes they're shapes or sometimes they just show you images and. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's different for them and it can even be different within the same time frame. For example, okay. um, if I, and I do not do readings for money, but I have done readings for people when it's need based, like they're really struggling emotionally and they need to communicate with a loved one. Mm -hmm. um, so I have on a few occasions done them for people and the spirit will, I think it's because of the strength of their energy at the time. At the beginning, they may show up three dimensionally and, and be very um, physical. But the more we do this, the more I notice them starting to fade a little bit. And then we may go from three-dimensional to pictures in my head. They'll show me in my mind's eye pictures. And I'll say, well, they're showing me blah, blah, blah. Or I'm hearing them tell me such and such. And then at that point, I'll say to them, is there something you really need to do? Because now's the time they're getting weak. Yeah. But like I said, I don't charge. It's it's not, you know. You're not trying to create it. No, it's not a business. I've only done it when people were truly hurting and they really needed help. So uh, let's go back to whenever you were young. So you're uh, you're very sensitive to this, and your your parents kind of they they I guess they believed you. My actually, you know what? My mother always said that I was imaginative. My grandmother believed me. My grandmother had the same ability. Mm. I would be in my forties before my mother would ever admit she could see them too. But she really she could not. She admitted it once, and I bawled because I had an entire lifetime of her telling me. <sighs> You know, you're just making this up, Patty. You've just got too much imagination. You need to quit reading ghost stories. So why did she cover hers up? Her because of life? her religious beliefs. Okay. She just couldn't reconcile her religious belief and what was going on in her life. Well, what's where? Where does the uh, wh where do the lines cross there? Why is that? Because I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual. I don't subscribe to a certain religion, but I can see why both could coincide what, what's the argument there what's the well um my mother was a fundamentalist christian okay so uh she took some passages from the bible quite literally that said mm. about not talking to the dead and divination and all oh, of this okay. so she thought that her ability to do this was more of a um the devil tempting her <clears throat> if you will and so she just tried to ignore it and make it go away and so she kept us in that same spot and um it took wow. until like I said, Mark and all of that. And then I had to sit down and reevaluate it and realize that this isn't going anywhere. And if I'm going to have to have it, then I might as well do something good with it. Yeah. Because I guess everything coming to you could be good or evil, right? I'm sure there's a lot of evil things that come along with a lot of good things. There are evil things. Now, most ghosts are not. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, probably 95, 98% of the ghost stories I would tell you are good stories. Mm -hmm. Um positive proactive you know or what have you um or poignant but not scary then there are a small percentage of ghost stories that are negative and then of course you would step further down into um the spiritual realm and with demonics and things like that so what are most ghosts doing like what is what are what is the reason they're stuck is it an unsolved answer or is it something that somebody needs to find it's all you i always think of like the ring or something it's, in, yeah. it's a girl in the well or you know something like that the answer is that it's as varied um a, a rationale as it is for everything we do in life as living people okay. so some ghosts are um the here because they like being here i had actually know of a, a lady her name was mrs kitz miller she actually haunts a house that my friend mark owns she worked very hard for 30 some years to buy this house and when I asked her if she wanted to cross over she responded no I, I worked for this so she's here because she wants to be then there are other people <laughs> who are 
um, they are waiting for something, whether it's a loved one to come across or they're, they're lost in some way. And then there are people who are confused because of maybe the trauma of their death. Mm-hmm. Um, you see that a lot on battlefields and car accidents, things like that. Right. Um, so everybody has a different rationale for doing what they're doing. Um, is that like purgatory? Is that what it's considered? Is there still just their spirits still just here? Or I don't think it's purgatory. From what I understand about the concept of purgatory, it is a place where you go if you don't quite make it to heaven, where you might earn your way back into the oh. holy realm, if you so to speak. Gotcha. So I think this is just it is a. I think everybody will eventually go wherever it is we need to go. Yeah. But God is a gentleman, and so. He doesn't force us to. We have to do it in our own time mm-hmm. and in our own way. If you go into near-death experiences, you will hear most of the time, you always hear the stories of the tunnel of light and like angelic beings or loved ones. Yeah. But although it's not as well popul- uh, popularized, there are also these, what they call the shadow people or the brown beings along the sides. I think that's probably what some ghosts are. But there's 14 classifications for ghosts. All the way from interactive, obviously intelligent beings to almost just reenactments playing over and over. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. So, like some ghosts, I always wondered, like if they're if they're haunting a house or if there's a car accident, are they stuck in a, a certain area, right? If there's a car accident and that's where their trauma happened, that's where they're stuck. If they were like murdered in a house and that's where it happened, they're stuck there until something's resolved, or. The answer is going to be um, they if they believe themselves to be stuck, they are stuck. Oh. It is what you believe is going to become your reality. And it's that way for all of us. Yeah. So if there's a person who's on a battlefield and they believe they can't cross over because they did a bad thing, they killed people, they stole a canteen, um, they did something wrong, they'll stay put until somebody helps them to understand that it's okay, that time's gone by, or that things are different now, or somehow you have to rationalize with them. And that's, so it's their perception is their reality. So through your years of doing this, have you, are you, are only people who are alive who can communicate with ghosts or spirits, the paranormal, are you the only ones who can free them from that? Or is there something else that can happen to them that would free them from being locked in that? Um, I think that they will eventually work their way through that process um, on their own. But it may take like but it hundreds may of years. Take like a couple hundred years. I mean, I'm hoping not, particularly if it's a traumatic thing and they're reliving a horrible event. Oh, yeah. um, what we do is called spirit rescue when you help somebody to cross over. Um, what we do is we try to kind of hurry the process along. It's kind of like therapy for dead people. Okay. You rationalize with them and you and you show them that. This doesn't make any sense to be here now. You don't have to be in this pain. A hundred years have gone by. We look different. We dress different. You know, and then you start working with them through that process. So they can see you as you are? Is that... They can. Now, sometimes they don't. Again, perception being reality. Yeah. But um, if you're able to communicate with them um, and they're able to recognize that, then, you know, you can go forward. There's a place um, at Antietam where um, there's a place called Burnside's Bridge. And Where's I, Antietam? It's in Maryland. Oh, okay. Okay, it's, it's a ba- Civil War battlefield from Ge- um, near, not too far from Gettysburg. Okay. And um, there is a, 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 sen- a soldier there on the bridge at Burnside's Bridge, and I have never made it past him in 20 years of going there. He is completely traumatized by what happened to him. He's missing the lower half of his face, so obviously this is how he died. And he looks at you with great pain, and I know he relives that moment over and over, but I can't get him far enough into reality to work with him. Hmm. But he's haunted me personally, not in a literal sense, but in an emotional sense. That he's still stuck there and you can't get him out. And I would love to help him because he doesn't need to be in that pain. Boy, uh, so going to a place like Gettysburg, is is that one of the places where you're kind of walking through a a land of spirits yeah and it's kind of like you have to put blinders on or like i will literally say i will not talk to any of you if you guys start pushing just one at a time because they know that you can see them and yes we've actually had spirits tell us um when we've been doing investigations mark and carolyn and i and and other people with us and um there will be a spirit come and it'll be really 
struggling and they'll say people they, they told us on the other side that there would be someone here today to help us so we came really? are you the person wow okay so i'll ask an obvious question that i think a lot of people who don't believe would ask uh how do you know it's just not you're not just imagining this you're not just making it up how do you know it's just not all created in your head and, and that's a great question real? um i the reason we know is quite often we'll get data um that we have no way of knowing or that I have no way of knowing at that moment in time. So I might be talking to a person and then Mark, who's a historian, who actually worked for the federal government on the battlefield. He was the battlefield historian at Gettysburg for oh, wow. many years. We'll go back and research it or mm -hmm. we'll get EVPs, voices that we recorded on the site. So we use a different mechanism to try to verify what's going on. Okay. And like whenever somebody comes and a spirit comes and talks to you, do you research them? Like, do you like look them up and try to match their story with like a newspaper publication or you if know possible, records? If possible, I mean, obviously, there's going to be spirits that you don't have that ability to to find, but if we can, it's it goes towards your validation, so that whenever you're in a place where you can't do that, like maybe a hotel where there's a transient population or a battlefield, yeah, um, you know, something like that, um, you'll give you'll be given the benefit of the doubt because in the past so many other times you have been accurate. Right. And that's why you tend to work with the same people over and over again. But um, at no point, even in the writing of the stories, do I ever suspend disbelief. Um, you have to be able to document. And so we research yeah. on a site, we research the history of the ground, of the house, or the whatever happened there. And that is all part of the whole story. The equipment that you see on the television shows, you know, the recordings and all of that, they're another facet of it. So I'm just one, one piece, of, the piece puzzle. of a huge puzzle, yeah. You're a pretty important piece of the puzzle. I call it bird dogging, and that's really what it is. Like, I will help get them. I cut through all the chaff and get to the place where the weed is, and then the guys can do their job. Yeah, because you're going to be the first line of defense. They're coming to you first. They're going to tell me. It's all say, hey, no, no, no. We're not talking to the little girl that supposedly haunts this place. Today there's a gentleman here, and his name is blah, 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 and he wants to talk about such and such. And so immediately then the EVP and all of the stuff will turn on to that. And then when we leave the site, the historians and the, and the researchers and stuff um, will, will do their job. So will you sometime – what do you normally do? Do you normally look up the information about the place beforehand when you're going there, or do you usually get there – see what you experience, and then see if that matches whenever you research afterwards. Well, if I am conducting the investigation, it's for my team, okay? I have to have the information because I'm going to have to lead them through the whole thing. So I need to be able to say, I need you to ask questions in this area and do something in this area and blah, blah, blah. So I'll recognize the signs and symptoms when they start coming back with data. Yeah. But then I can't bird dog at that investigation. Somebody else will have to. Okay. Um, because I'm, I already have too much information. I prefer to not know anything if I'm going to do you know, the sensitive route because it messes with my head and I start second guessing myself and thinking, did I read that? Yeah. Oh, I'm that's just, what I would, think. you know, that's, that's the problem. You'd be putting pieces of the puzzle together that aren't there. Exactly. You're just creating them. Because so the deal is when I'm going for that purpose and that's my job for like with Mark and Carol or something, then I know nothing. I, I literally will be told, come to such and such a site and meet us there. We'll drive you to the place. Okay. Blindfolded. And, and Well, not blindfolded, thank God. <laughs> but, you know, just it's um, – and it's easier on me so that I know that what I'm getting and I've made the connect and then we'll just work it from there. Um, so when you were first writing these books, had you ever been validated at that point or were you just – you knew you were connected with something. You didn't feel comfortable talking about it. So you went out and, and found stories of other people who had had this happen and wrote about that. I remember uh, – I'm going to go back to when I was like a little girl. I was like seven. And I told my mother I wanted to be a writer. Writing is very important to me. It's a vital function. It is like breathing. Um, and I knew by the time I was 12, I found the books of a gentleman by the name of Elliot O'Donnell, who was a third generation ghost hunter in England. And um, I wanted to do what he did, which was go and investigate. And I wanted to write stories about other people's hauntings, in large part because they were of a private validation for me. But nobody else needed to know that. So, um, and my family had a lot of ghost stories because obviously I was not the only person. So I started collecting family stories. Somebody said, you should put them in a book. And I started by writing those. I sent it to a publisher who came back and said, make it bigger. 
So I wrote about people throughout the state, and then the second publisher purchased it. And, um, you know, so it was always a private thing until well into into my writing, about um, 15 years into the writing. Now, there's something you just said that might be off topic from uh, paranormal stories, but that you wrote a book and they asked you to add more to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens now, right, with books. Like, they, they want more content. Back in the day, you'd write a book, it was like, uh, I've been reading uh, As a Man Thinketh. It's like 40 pages. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be any longer because it is so amazing. It's such an amazing book with so much information and 40 pages. But now, if somebody wrote that book, they'd want it to be 500 pages. And you'd have to add tons of stories and details and all this stuff to it. Is that kind of what... Went well, on. it was, I think it was more of they were looking for a market base because, you know, it's a business yeah. and you have to work it like a business. So they were looking at having the ability to have a market base to sell it to. So they were like, it was a regional publisher. So they wanted to do all of Pennsylvania. And I certainly knew a lot of Pennsylvania ghost stories. So I began, you know, actively looking for them and then going to some of the places and what have you. I didn't write about going to the places uh, very often, a couple times, but not very often. And um, But I, I just told the stories of the hauntings that were going on there and of other people. And I, they were newspaper accounts and interviews and what have you. Um, and then that kind of grew into the, the larger book, Haunted Pennsylvania. And then from there, it just kind of went forward. So as far as Pennsylvania goes... What is your favorite story that most people may not know about? Like maybe one that's, you know, not like Gettysburg right. or something like that, but something that stood out to you. I think I love the historical figures and their ghost stories. So I think Matt Anthony Wayne's probably one of my favorite. Matt Anthony Wayne has the distinction of being um, a Revolutionary War hero, of being kind of a, a blackguard who would be a horrible drunk. He's instrumental in half a dozen ghost stories and he's supposedly haunts the entire state from end to end because <laughs> okay. his his well he has he haunts the entire northeast but the story is and it's a true story that when he died he was up in erie and they buried him near the blockhouse at the fort at prescott and um about 10 or 15 years go by and his family decides to bring him back home which is down near york so his son rides up and he thinks he's going to be bringing back a bag of bones but when they dig up the body, he's still fully there because the peat moss kept him from deteriorating. Oh, wow. So now they're stuck with this, you know, what do we do? And a doctor <laughs> comes up with this idea, which is macabre. I cannot understand how anybody would have thought this, but this is what truly happened. Um, they boil the bones off from the flesh. They rebury the flesh at Presque Isle, and they take the bag of bones and they send it back to York. Oh, but geez. it's it's it, the cauldron still sits in the museum in Erie where they did this. <laughs> wow! So it's not a, it's not a made up story. <laughs> okay. And um, the story goes that his son was so rattled by the events that he didn't secure the bones appropriately. So as he's riding back across the state, some of the bones bounced out. And on January first, which is um, Anthony Wayne's birthday, he supposedly rides across the state to find his missing bones. <laughs> I love that story. It's just a great classic ghost story. Now, let me ask. So this is confusing to me, right? Because you said that a lot of ghosts are here trying to f get to the other side. And they maybe have had something that they're repeating over and over and over again. How would he be able, why, or why would he be going after his bones? Because he already would have been dead, and he's going to get his bones. So that wasn't like his mission before he died. Like that wasn't the trauma experience before he died. No, it wasn't. And it may just be that it's a classical ghost that's story. That's the story. You know, okay. that's the story. But it is a cool story, and he does have a lot of other ghost stories um, that he begat over the course of his lifetime. Um during one of his drunken rages, he had an aide-de-camp uh, shot and then later on realized he had had an innocent man shot, which is actually in a couple of the books. It's called um, Trotter's Curse. Okay. The gentleman's name was Trotter. And supposedly he haunted Anthony Wayne for the rest of his life. Um, so there's, there's a whole plethora of ghost stories that go with Anthony Wayne. But, you know, that is just such an out there kind of story that any writer or any storyteller would enjoy telling that tale. Yeah. It's the historical aspect of it, too. Yes. It's awesome. Uh, um, it, is that something that you think happens that, like, if, uh, you know, with, with his bones being scattered across the state, um, do ghosts are seeking out something sometimes? Spirits are like they're seeking for a lost 
whatever it might be. I mean, I guess there could be any number of reasons why they would still be here. Yeah, and there are out. any number of reasons. Usually they're, they're after something or someone from their past, from their lifetime. Um, a lot of times it'll be a, a loved one that they were waiting for or they, they have an unresolved issue. I think there's only been one time in my entire life that I ever met a ghost who couldn't see. There's like a little spot of light that apparently we see whenever we die. And that spot of light, is, if you watch it, gets larger and turns into the doorway, that tunnel of light we all hear about. Mm-hmm. And it's only been once in my lifetime I've ever met a spirit who told me he could not see the, t- the dot of light. And when I realized why he couldn't see it, it changed everything. But it comes back to your question because why he couldn't see it was the reason he was also stuck. He was here because of avarice. Avarice. Um, he was a soldier during the Civil War. This would have happened in Virginia. And okay. I was in uh, Virginia working and encountered this man. He had a little bag on his neck and he kept holding on to it very tight, clutching it. And I, you know, we talked talk to him and I tried to help him to cross over. He seemed very agitated and he kept saying he couldn't. And finally he told me that he had stolen the stuff that was in the bag, rings and what have you, to take home to his family because they were dirt poor. Mm-hmm. And this was, he thought, their ticket. But he died before he got there. Mm. And so he wouldn't let go of that bag. Oh. And that wouldn't let him let go of all that pain and that angst and anger and pain, all of that. And when I finally said to him, you need to drop the bag. And he's like, I can't. I'm like, no, 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 you need to take it off. You've got to get rid of it. And he finally, he pulled on it and, he, and it just fell. And when it fell, it just it disappeared. That's no other way to explain it. It just became nothing because it really wasn't there. It was just his imagination of it, his, you know, his emphasis on it, if you yeah. will. And then all of a sudden he started to cry and he said, I can see that light. I can see that light. I said, now you can go. And then he got to go. But it was, that was the thing for him that held him here. Is a ghost here the same as a human year? So, like, no, I don't think so. So, like, if they're from the Civil War, is it like, man, I've been walking around this place for two hundred years? No, this has been a long, boring time. Nobody else is here. Like, <laughs> I will tell you some of the funny comments I've heard um, are things like, "I wondered why people were rude to me. Nobody talks to me now." Stuff like that. So um, he sees everybody. They, or they, 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 they are at least aware of other people moving about. And so they quit over the course of time trying to talk to people because... So initially they probably could, just like yeah. they didn't know they were dead. A lot of times. Now, some people do know they're dead. Which is just like the sixth sense, right? I mean, that's yeah. one of my... One of, I'm sure you've seen it, right? Yes, I've But seen he it. doesn't know that he's dead, not to ruin the movie for anybody who hasn't seen it over the course of 20 years or 19 years. But, uh, yeah, that's... You would think that if something traumatic happened to you, uh, it would make sense how your spirit wouldn't know what exactly happened. It it depends. I mean, I remember um, talking to a soldier. Also, it was in Virginia. um, And and Mark had taken me to four battlefields. And um, I was kind of overwhelmed at that point. We were on our third battlefield. And he just said, walk along. And this is when he was sort of letting me get my feet under me. And he said, walk along and tell me what you see. And this was... um, I told him what I saw, and I remember crying and saying to him, oh, my God, I thought Gettysburg was the worst thing I'd ever see because that was my benchmark, you know. But these people, it was raining, and yet they were so thirsty, and they were literally stepping people, wounded people, down into the mud. And I was watching this whole thing, and I came across this one boy, and he was laying there crying, and he said, "Um, I can't go anywhere. And I said, why? And he said, because I killed people, and that's murder. So I'll go to hell. And I sat there for a moment, and I was just sobbing. And I said, honey, you were in a battle. You were protecting yourself. Don't you think God knows the difference? And we talked about David, the King David of the Bible, and how he was a warrior king, and yet God loved him, and kind of slowly inched him toward the idea that God could forgive. And he understood the difference between just willfully picking up a gun and shooting somebody for no reason and defending yourself when people are shooting at you. And eventually the boy left, but it took a little bit of rationalizing with him because he was held there by the, his fear that he was going to go to hell because he did a bad thing. I would assume you're some sort of some form of faith faith based. Is that right, or how does that? Yeah, I'm not a traditional Christian in the fact that I don't go to church on Sunday, but I have great faith in God. 
And this would be the issue where somebody who thinks that what you're doing is, you know, going against God or is not is going towards the devil or whatever it might be, you wouldn't be able to do this if you didn't believe, right? There's a quote in the Bible um, that is very pertinent and very precious to me, and it is when <clears throat> Christ is casting out demons, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, somebody says to him, oh, you are of Satan. And he turns and he looks at him and says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And his words mean that if I were of Satan, I would have to function under Satan's rules. Yeah. But I function and I use the word of God and I use the name of God. Mm. So, um, you know, again, we're going to go back to perception as reality. So if they are Catholic in their faith or they're Protestant in their faith, or even if they were Buddhist in their faith, I would have to kind of get into what their mindset is because perspective is theirs. I meet them where they are, not them meet me where I'm at, yeah. but always with faith. And I always have that underpinning of great faith in God. This is fascinating. Um, I, I have a series of questions lined up in my head. I'm going to ask the next one. Uh, whenever they talk to you, is it like um, in the movies, it'll be like an, a reverse echo or some weird sound effect You know, they, they create? What does it sound like when one of them is talking to you? It doesn't sound like me talking to you, does it? Or is it? You can very, tell the very rarely do I hear them audibly. Once in a blue moon, but very rarely. Um, if you close your eyes, I'll give you the experience of being in my head. If you close your eyes and you imagine what, say, the bedspread on your bed looks like, that's how I see them in my mind's eye. What the bedspread on my bed, bed looks, looks like. like. That's how I would see them in my mind's eye. If you close your eyes and you start thinking about a conversation you had with somebody, that's how I hear them. I okay. have to. It's a quiet little voice, okay. and I have to sit very softly and quiet, or I'll close my eyes. And it's not because I need to, other than I just want to shut the rest of the world out because I got to focus on it to let it get strong enough I can hear it, and then I listen for what they're telling me. And then, like I said, sometimes they'll show me images. Maybe they're not able to in their mind. They can't talk, so they'll they'll show me a picture of something and I'll say, I'm seeing a picture of such and such and I don't know what this means to them, but this is what it is. Do you ever get confused whether, like if you're just hanging out somewhere, you're not, you're not doing this actively and you start to get something in your head? Are you confused? Like, was that me thinking or is that the ghost? Or These are, uh, these are questions I've had for such a long time because <laughs> yeah. I don't know how all that works. I do believe you, but it's yeah. also like, how, what is it like? like no, because I, I know always, I have two different voices in my head. Yeah, I've always <laughs> can tell the difference between them. First of all, um, you know, it isn't my thought. And immediately I recognize this isn't my thought. I've done it long enough now that I recognize the difference. Yeah, I would imagine, yes. Yeah. And... Um, but yeah, it's not my thoughts. And usually there's something that they're asking me to do, mm. whether it's listen to them or help them or they're they're in a panic or they're they're just trying to com to tell me something. So it's different than um, my own personal thoughts. I recognize the difference. And I guess to anybody who would think that you're making it all up, why how could you number one and why would you because nobody would want to be bombarded with Nobody would, maybe it's somebody would. <laughs> Actually, some people would probably love that. Um, but you wouldn't just be doing it for fun all of these years. I mean, you were saying it whenever you were a child and your parents were, uh, you know, trying to get you to stop or to ignore it or to pretend that it's not there. Well, and I understand why because I, I have children you know, that are now adults and I yeah. did the same with them because you don't want them to be different or labeled or what have you. It's right. not nearly as bad now as it was, you know, 45 years ago very true um but there was a stigma attached to it and um the answer to the question about um for skeptics is i don't make any money off of it the books stand on their own and they always have and they always will i have never taken a penny from anybody to help them living or dead obviously <laughs> um and if you think you really want it then you're crazy right because I would give anything in my life to get rid of it. Is that right? Is that how you... Yeah. Or be able to turn it on and off, I guess. No, because it makes you different. It makes you look at the world in a different way. And I don't walk through the battlefields of Gettysburg the way everybody else does. I see people with half their faces blown away. People reaching up, bawling for water. I don't want to live in a nightmare. Nobody wants to live in a nightmare. Yeah. The only way I've ever made sense of it is that I've got to do something to help these people. That's my coping mechanism. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do it. If I had a choice, if God gave me like a choice and said, this is this is it, you could pick, 
I turn it off. Yeah. But I can't turn it off, so I got to figure out a way to use it for a good thing. Yeah. Exactly. You're, it's there for a reason. You have the the skill or the power or whatever you want to call it for a reason. So you're using it for the right reason. I try to help people. I try to help people who have passed and are not sure of what's going on. I try to help living people make peace with some trauma with a dead loved one or something like that. Um, I try to make life a little better for the people that come into my universe and they find me. I don't advertise about this part. I mean, this is about as big an advertisement as I've ever done in my entire life. Yeah. And by the way, I didn't reach, or Patty didn't reach out to me or anything, anybody listening. Like, this was all me coming to you. I just, I found it so fascinating that I had to talk to you. But Uh, it was because you talked to Kenny and Kenny knows me and, um, and he told you, you need to talk to me if you're about the subject. Yeah. And then he called me and said, hey, go do this, go do this, it'll be fun. And I'm very grateful for the, the opportunity. But yeah, I would, I mean, it's it's not always pleasant. I feel, physically, I can feel their pain sometimes. You know, it's an emotional thing. I can go through their emotions. Why would I put myself through that for nothing? And I don't make anything from it. Yeah, it's something that you've been given and you're going to have to deal with. You cope with it. You figure out a way to cope, cope with, with it. it. Right. Uh, and I guess some people who have this ability cope with it by losing their mind, I'd imagine, right? Or They struggle. They get angry. They get frustrated. Um, I have my oldest son is um, – he struggles with it a lot because he's very good at it and he doesn't want to be. So your all of your kids have some sort of sense? Or? Two of my kids, my oldest and my youngest. Okay. I have three. And um, – but I think we all have to some, discre- some to some degree a little bit of it. It's whether or not we learn to discount it. Mm-hmm. And the more you use it, it's like a muscle. The more you use it, the better it gets. Mm-hmm. But um, my oldest son wants nothing to do with it at all. My youngest son will deal with it a little bit. Once in a while, my middle boy just shrugs and says, you know, I know you guys aren't lying to me, but... It's not there. It's normal. You know, <laughs> to him, that's normal. Dead people are normal because that's been his life experience. Yeah. And for somebody that it wasn't normal, it's hard to grasp how it could be possible right some people don't even think it could be possible that there could be ghosts and i'm i'm right there in whatever whatever i experience and whatever i believe from somebody is what i'm gonna go towards right Right. but it's a it's a it's one of the oldest um human experiences that's ever been recorded every culture in the world has experienced it every religion in the world addresses it in some fashion Mm -hmm. um so it is what it is. And um, I have never cared, and I really frankly don't care now probably less than ever in my life, whether the people think. I don't do this part for the money. And, um, you know, it's like I do some cases that where there's negative things, demonics and stuff. Those are also not for money. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with that part of it for me. It's about reaching out and helping somebody who's really struggling, who's scared, who's lost, whether they're a living or a dead person, who's lost. Yeah. And I pray to God if ever I or anyone I love comes to that point that somebody will be there to reach out to them. Yeah, that's awesome. Going to like, okay, so it seems, correct me if I'm wrong on this. I, re- I, re- I read an article or listened to something that, that talked about this, but apparently now there's less ghost sightings than there used to be like, you know, 100, 150, 200 years ago. Like it's, it's, it seems to have decreased in the frequency. Um, the reason they gave was that there was, there's more noise now, there's more distractions now, there's like more everything now. And back then with less sound, with less light, you were more accustomed to hearing or seeing something, but then they also <clears throat> chalked that up to maybe just because there was not a lot of noise, you thought you heard something else that wasn't there. Is there? Well, I think that people think about ghosts at night mostly because of that, because we have less noise and less distraction at night, so we notice it more. Yeah. I don't know that there's less ghosts. I would probably disagree with that. but um, More people, more ghosts. I guess I think, that makes sense, right? Well, I, I just think that um, there's more struggle, yeah. if you will, to be heard. But... Um, I think that there always have been and always will be a percentage of us who, for whatever the reason, need to be heard yet before they go. Um, it's just that we're not listening as well. Mm-hmm. Although, <laughs> we can watch Ghost Hunters or any of those shows, lots of people were listening with all sorts of crazy technology. Well, so, and, I, and I have to tell you, they're TV shows. I, I'm not speaking of anybody, you know, God bless. Um, 
but some of the technology is functional and isn't functional and it's you know it's hollywood they they're paying you know a good bit of money to do this so they want results yeah um it is what it is some of it's legit some of it's not um and there's a double edged sword to all the paranormal shows because on one hand people really like it so there's less stigma but on the other hand people think if you get a big black t-shirt that says ghost hunter on it you know and all of a sudden you got a show and a recorder yeah you're now you're now a demonologist good luck with that cuz i've spent yeah. Like 35 years of my life doing this, and I don't know anything yet. I went ghost hunting one time with a crew, mm -hmm. and I was very bored. It's like you got you got to really be into it. I mean, you got to be dedicated to finding those ghosts because I was after an hour or two like, whew. There it, I it is. That. I mean, that's that's the misnomer because the show's kind of painted as something happens every five minutes, but really, you're getting um, hundreds of hours of footage and yeah, maybe you're five doing minutes. you know two, three, four, five nights in a site to get one EVP, you know, and that may be a kick-ass EVP that's really going to rock, but you have to be patient and you have to go back multiple times. It isn't as easy as turn on your cell phone and boom, there you go. Maybe once in a while you'll get lucky. It's yeah. always the luck of the draw. But, um, you know, most of the time it's laborious and tedious. And for every hour on a site, we spend 15 to 20 hours doing research and listening to all that stuff. How and do you listen to all that audio hours of nothing? You're listening to hours of... You do it in um, in little increments and then you pass it on to somebody else to do it again. Now, see, I would think there would be some sort of technology that would detect, like, you could, like... Put it in a system and it would scan it all and then pick out like there little is, but things. sometimes it misses stuff. Okay. And actually, what this is the ghost hunter part of me coming out now. Um, today, everybody uses uh, voice activated equipment, okay, mm -hmm. because they don't want to listen to twenty hours. And so you, you know, what is your name? And you wait, and boom, there you should get something, okay. But they also the the dead talk to you whenever you're just having a conversation. And you don't get that stuff. So on a site, I always try to have have us mic'd up all the time. It is boring. It is tedious. I freely admit it. It might take me two weeks to listen to eight hours of, of audio that way. Because you can only listen and focus for 20 to 30 minutes and then you're done. Oh, it'd be hard. Now, let me ask you this. So y they're talking to you. Mm -hmm. Yet if you turn on your voice recorder, you probably wouldn't pick up what they were saying. You will pick it up. But that's the point. If they just do the question answer session and then turn it off, you've missed stuff. So they don't talk to you. Do they talk to you in sentences or paragraphs or is it like bursts of information? Sometimes sentences, uh, mostly sentences. Um, for example, I was sitting in a site. Years and they have like an accent. They have like a, a voice. Okay. Yeah. Sitting in a site years ago with a friend of, our, of mine at a ghost hunt. It's the middle of the night. The building is shut down. It's just him and I in a room. And I said to him, I, it was kind of a break room. So I said to him, hey, how did it go for that test for your job today? Knowing he'd been looking for a job for a while. And he was very excited about this particular job. And he shook his head and he said, well, I don't know if I got it because they told me all the wrong stuff to study. When you listen to that recording back, you hear that conversation. But when he says, I don't know if I got it, they told me the wrong stuff to study, you hear another male voice come in and he goes, stupid. There was only two people in the room. <laughs> so he was busting this guy's chops and nobody would have known that if I had turned off the recording. But you didn't see him say that? Or I hear didn't him hear say him. That? I didn't hear him and I didn't see him. I was focusing, I had the shutters, the blinds up, if you will, talking to this guy. This was my downtime. So you can't really talk to both at the same time. It would, I can, but to... it's a struggle. Wow. Uh. And it's also a struggle to remember parts of it. Yeah. Like there's usually somebody that goes with me and they'll do the writing about what's going on because I can't do anything else while I'm doing it, like take pictures or do audio or any of that. So I will say, you know, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm hearing. They're writing it down. This is the person's name. They're writing it down. And I'll remember bits and pieces and I'll go back later and I'll say, you know, no, the guy, the guy I was talking to about such and such, what was his name? What was his name? And then they'll look in the notes and find it. So my question is like, so in that moment when you're talking to that person, you have your voice recorder. Why isn't it just picking up what he's saying? Or is it something that's like just going into your head? Because obviously nobody else in the well, room can hear it. So it's on like a different frequency that only... It's just going into my head most of the time. But there are times when I'll laugh at what they're saying. And Mark will look at me and he'll go, what? I'll go play it back. This is this one I think you caught. Because it was so loud. 
And then he'll play it back and he'll go, really? And I'm like, yeah. Or I've written them down. I've actually written them down. We were with uh, Brad Christman from Pennsylvania Radio News Network one time. And um, we were at a place called the Engine House in Gettysburg. And I heard the lady say the answer to the question. I wrote it down and handed it to Brad. And when he played the recording back, it was what I wrote. Really? Yes. Wow. Okay, so I guess we can say a little bit about this um, this show. This show. We were, we were just talking about all the ghost hunter shows, but you're not really making a ghost hunter show. No, it's not about ghost hunting. It is about... Um, this is with Kenny Dodson, who was just on the yes. podcast. He's a uh, he's Hollywood film editor, but now doing yes. the PA Traveler, amongst other things, as, yes. with, with, with you as well. And um, like I said, I've known Kenny <clears throat> for years, and I was talking to him about my take on what should be on TV about this. And it's about um, educating about the reality of what it is, what it is like to be me or to be a person like me or to be even a spirit. And it's about darker hauntings. And um, there's a lot of misnomers because Hollywood just focuses on one thing. Like, for example, possession. Yeah. Everybody thinks that demons are the thing that possess people. But more people are possessed by dead people than they are by demons by far. Really? So um, <clears throat> it's about telling a good story and educating and doing all of that at the same time. But it's not focused on, it's not like a reality-based show where you, um, you know, you're just going to see a reenactment and they're going to be going, oh my God, dude, did you hear that? Did you hear that? It's not that Coming up next. Yeah. On the Patty Wilson Project. Or exactly. whatever you decide to yeah, call it. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's, it's, about, it's about sharing some very um, yeah. intimate stories. To get real with it. Yeah, like I want it to be authentic. Re- re- I want it to be the reality of what really happens and and how severe the cases are. And it really all stemmed for me from a conversation I had with a woman who was possessed. And um, I spoke with her one day, and I was, she was telling me about how she got help. And she told me, she said, I went to 16 priests and ministers, and they either handed me a bottle of holy water or told me it was all in my head. We'll pray for you. Go home. And she eventually found John Zaffis, who's the premier demonologist in the country. We all know him as the um, haunted collector where's from television. F- where's he from? Um, he's from uh, Connecticut. But he's, um, he is an amazing man. And she found John. And through John, she found help. And I was talking to her about this. And she was crying and telling me about the day she almost had herself committed. And she knew she wasn't insane. And she knew her universe was going to change. She was a, a housewife, a mom of two kids. She drove the school bus. She volunteered at the fire department. She was every lady. She was just a regular person. Mm-hmm. And um, added to this was the component that this was um, a sexual demon that was attacking her physically. And she knew that she was never going to get to be a mom and a housewife and drive the school bus again if she went through this. And so she went back to her car and sat for hours and cried and then eventually a week later found somebody who took her to John's office and said so, so she help. knew that she was possessed like she she knew it she knew okay. but she but where do you go who what, do you go for help to right. well yeah yeah that to be that's a hard one and that was the point because everybody thinks you're crazy and I mean even saying it sounds crazy right it does and, and, I'm beyond, and, and to be honest with you and I used to get mad at them and I now get it better than I did 20 years ago um, a lot of ministers and priests are afraid of it it's scary it is scary it's scary for me, but um, I'd imagine, yeah. I've know, seen The Exorcist, you know. It's you know, it's not quite that bad usually. <laughs> I mean, there's no pea soup. Okay? Stigmata. I've seen stigmata. But um, the fact is that there's no hope for these people because they don't know who to ask. So, what eventually happens to somebody who's possessed if they never get unpossessed or depossessed? They die that way. So it doesn't. It w- I guess it does kill them faster. Or is it just to t- sometimes. terrorize Sometimes. I mean, them? sometimes. I mean, if you look at the Annalise Michelle story, that one, she died because of, as a result of it, you know, one way or the other. Um, they live their lives that way. Some people actually get rid of it and, and invite it back because it's their version of normal. And when they lose it, they aren't quite sure how to cope without it. So there's a lot of psychology involved in all of this as well. But, um, and, and to make no mistake, like, you know, that's the, the job I do in the daytime is I work in the field of psychology. And um, I recognize all the psychological components that are going on. And it's not the first place I go to when somebody starts the story. I'm listening for specific things. Yeah. And we have hooked people up with, you know, psychiatrists and therapists and counselors over the years because that was really their gig. That's what they needed. 
And it's a quiet thing. It's just, you know, let me call somebody and see if we can get you an appointment to get some help because I think this is where you really need to go. So first of all, I was thinking that every like ghost hunter must be so jealous of you. They're like, oh, she can... Like, we have to use all this equipment to try to hear something. She gets it right away. But then you would say nobody would ever want this. Actually. I would tell you that. But I do have, like, I have fun busting my guys' chops because, like, they'll bring the two great big cases of equipment. And they'll go, we're packed and ready to go. And I'm like, me too. And you're with a notepad in your hand. And I'm like, me too. I got it. You know? And they're like, really? You know? <laughs> they're spending tens of thousands of dollars on equipment. I believe you can. And bringing five vans with them. Um, yeah, that would be... You have a distinct advantage over them. I think when it comes to making a show and making it realistic and that sort of thing. Uh, when it comes to the possession, that's uh, can you be possessed by a good spirit? Or is possession always bad? Um, possession is, I will say, always bad only because it's it's like a parasite. It's like taking over your life. Yeah, it's, it's taking, it's negating your free will. Whatever it is, whoever, I mean, I've had, there's st some really interesting stories of people who were possessed by family members um, and things like that. And whether people want to believe it or not, I would ref rec recommend that they go and look into the field because there is in the field of psychology, uh, Dr. Edith Fury, who is a psychologist, wrote a wonderful book on the subject. Uh, M. Scott Peck, who's also a psychologist, wrote a really interesting book on the subject. And um, so it's recognized, maybe not well recognized, but recognized in the realms of psychology hmm. and um, as a separate and distinct event. But it's parasitic always in nature because it negates your right to have free will. And the, the, like the parasites, the possessed, they come and go? Are they there all the time? Or is it like a, something triggers it to happen? Um, How do you know it's not like a, a bipolar disorder? You know? Well, and, and there are things that, that make it different. Um, if I may tell a story from um, Dr. Edith Fury's book, which would probably be the best answer to that very quickly. She had a client early on in her career where it was a woman she had presented, and she had an entirely different personality, 180-degree turnaround. Nice woman, housewife, mother, never cheated on her husband, and suddenly she was finding herself waking up in compromising positions with other people and doing things that she knew were not her. Was she on Ambien? She was not. <laughs> she was not, okay. although that's a good joke. That was a joke, yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, But so she went to a, a psychiatrist to find out what was going on. Why was she blacking out? Why was she not remembering what was she doing? Why was she doing things that were so against her nature? Yeah. And um, throughout the course of this... Um, the, uh, Dr. Fury kind of put her in a suggestive state where she's not in hypnosis but just relaxed. And as she's talking, she starts hearing little tells, things that, that don't make sense to her. So she, this, she says, well, you know, who am I talking to right now? And her first thought was multiple personality syndrome. And the person identified himself. And he was bragging about what he was making the woman do. He gave an address and the years that he lived in the same house she had been in and all of this stuff. And still, multiple personality is what she's thinking. And she writes about this in the book. And she says, but after the woman left the, ha the building that day, something in her drove her to go and find out, was there a person by that name? And did they ever live in that house? And what happened to them? And when she started to do the research, she found out that everything the spirit told her was true. It, so that kind of tipped her off, you know, from multiple personality, which is a fragmenting of a singular person's psyche okay. into fragments so that it can cope with a trauma. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, to what if, just what if. So the next time she had the woman come in, she did the suggestive state again. She said, I don't want to talk to you, sweetheart. I want to talk to him. And he came forward. So she began to deal with his trauma and his arrogance. And when she dealt with him and he agreed to leave, the woman no longer had problems. She was cured. And that's what started her down that path. Wow. So with uh, multiple personality disorder, you can't just get rid of all of the voices. You have to address the trauma. You address but the trauma and then integrate the parts of the personality. Because they're all parts of the same personality, but they fragment to, to create a protective circle, if you will. Like one might be the angry person. One might be allowed to be the child. One might be the person they really are in day life and, you know, and what have you. And so they're circling around They're protecting. So they allow, like she may not in her, her reality, her real life, have that protective ability like she can't get aggressive with it but there's one part of her that can yeah so it'll jump in and take over and it's a fragmenting of a whole psyche of one whole psyche that's so crazy i was watching a tony robbins thing once where he brought a girl on stage and I, I, it was it wasn't hypnosis but it was something along those lines and she had different people right. not in like a multi-person not in like 
a disorder kind of way. Mm-hmm. He was just talking to a different version of her. Right. Now, whether you know believe that or not, it was like her when she was being authoritative or right. whatever. Like, we all have a different person we step right. into, I guess. And so that would be like the norm of us. We all have those moments when we're going to buck it up. But in this instance, they separate and they're not aware of each other. Or some of them are aware of each other, but other ones are not protective. Like, they might protect the child part of her. Yeah. So in the possession case, you know it's a separate thing because it's not a part of who that person is. It's, it it's, isn't. Now, they're I, bragging about, well, I guess that the person was bragging about yeah, controlling look what I, her. Look what I make her do. And what? so what would, the, if the purpose of like a ghost usually is to find something or to, to have themselves be heard or to solve something, then what's the purpose of a possession? Are you, you're taking, you're controlling that person to... Well, what? there's a couple purposes. Um, if it's a ghost who's possessing a person, okay, it's usually because they're trying to vicariously um, recreate or live through something. Maybe perhaps, a, perhaps it's an addiction. With him, it was a sex addiction. It could be alcoholism. It could be all kinds of you know things like that. So right. they try to force that person into wow. that that mold. Wow. Um, and they're called lesser spirits because they have a negative impact. Um, but there can be positive uh, possessions, like where they're trying to do, like they're helping people. <laughs> like, well, I mean, there's there's a couple of stories. There's there's the Lorenzi Vellum story from Illinois. That's a rarity, but it is there, and it's a very complicated story. But it's about a young woman by the name of Mary Roth who had um, spirit possessions, things taking her over, and she struggled. Her it was in the 1800s, and her father eventually had her committed to an insane asylum where she died. Fast forward. About 12 years, he reads a newspaper article about a little girl by the name of Lorenzi Vellum who's struggling in very much the same ways he has his Mary had. And he thinks, oh, my God, I've got to do something. I've got to go talk to this family and say, you're not alone. Don't put her in an insane asylum. There's got to be a different answer. Now, this was at the height of the spiritualist movement, late 1800s. So he brings a spiritualist minister he's become friends with with him. And when they get to the house... Long and short of it is, Lorenzi says, Daddy, it's you. It's me, Mary, you know. And he realizes his Mary is possessing her. And the family's devastated, and it's very confusing for everybody. Eventually, they just, out of pity, because she cries and weeps so piteously, let her go with a- with this man, Asa Roth. And she has memories of her life as, as Mary. She's asking questions about, you know, what did you do with the, for the sweater I crocheted you? And what did you name the baby? I know you were pregnant when mm-hmm. I died and all of this. And she explains to them that Lorancy is sick and that she's, her spirit is sick and it's in heaven being fixed. She's healing. And while she's being healed, Lorancy's letting me use her body. There were other spirits, lesser spirits, that were trying to take her over, but I'm going to keep her safe until... And so it's a very, but it's an interesting story because it's Blow very, my mind. it's interesting because it was very well documented because mm-hmm. there was the minister, there were doctors, there were people observing who were writing about this as the whole process goes on. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, like, that's, that's like, that's hard to believe, right? It is hard, but like that's I said, it's crazy. a pretty well documented story. Look it's it up. Wild. I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the thing. I, I love the fact that there's, there's so much proof behind some of this. So like when she's. Okay, when you got to the, what you're saying about the part of like there's a bunch of different spirits that were like going to possess her. Right. Are certain, like you are apt to be able to be sensitive to these sorts of things. Are the people who are apt to be possessed, like they're just, that's their I think persona? maybe they have a um, a weakness, if you will, or something that, that might call them in. In this instance, Lorenzi was apparently spiritually sick or something, and other spirits were trying to take advantage of it, negative ones, and Mary saw an opportunity and stepped in. And she told them, I'll be here for a day, for a time, you know, and she was there for several months. And then one day she said to her mama, mama, don't cry, but I have to go in a few days. Lorenzi's getting better now. And then a couple of days went by, and then Lorenzi was suddenly there, and Mary's no longer in her and she just doesn't know who these people are and she's bawling for her parents and they call the and she had recently been up in heaven getting fixed well that's her what mary soul was be- yeah that's what mary was explaining it as I so mean, she was saying that like mary wasn't even actually there at the time that Lorancy was not there that the, Lorancy, sorry, that, yeah that yeah. Lorancy stepped out and that the body was still there but the spirit was was elsewhere being jeez 
it's a really interesting story to read. So I'd say that would be possibly a rare exception. Most of the time, wow. it's lesser or negative spirits that, that do this because higher spirits usually move on and they have more more respect. What kind of jerk would want to jump inside of your body and control you? And destroy your life. I yeah. Because a lot of times it's very destructive. Yeah. So there's a difference between go ghosts and uh, demons. Demons, they have one purpose and only one purpose to go back to answer your question okay go back to the biblical stuff um demons do this not because we are of any value to them because we are not mm -hmm. but because we are of value to god our spirit is of right. value to god That's it. so it is to harm him because the shortest way to hurt a parent is to harm the child yeah and so when they take and harm one of god's children humans then they're causing him pain. Yeah. And so it is always, we're the collateral damage in a spiritual war. And they're war. like hurting everybody around them. So it's like spreading all the, the yes. pain. So, okay. So whenever this, a spirit maybe like uh, Mary, but then a spirit like, or a demon, like where does that come from? I mean, obviously it probably, it comes from hell. But like, where does that come from? Why is it happening? Or what could be the reason? You mean what is the opening that allows for it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I wish I knew all the answers because most of the people that I have ever met or most of the people that I've ever read about who are um, oppressed, there's three different levels, possession being the most severe, okay? Obsession, oppression, and possession. Okay. Um, they are decent people, and I think that might actually be one of the criteria in some way that, that it's almost like um, I'm going to smear this good spirit. I'm going to drag them Because that would really get through. God. Yeah, I'm going to drag him through the mud kind of a deal. Yeah. Hmm. So they, they wouldn't go after somebody who's already a bad person. Wouldn't do them much good. I don't think it would be as battle. noticeable because there's a lot right. of um, of energy that gets put out in this process. A lot, and you know, there are spirits that eat energy. There are demonics that eat energy that they use that energy, and it's not usually one spirit that one demonic that possesses. It's usually it's like a procession a hierarchy is a lower level will start and then as you get weaker the next level will step in and next level will up and it just keeps ratcheting it up that's why usually when you read like even in the bible what is your name my name is legion for there are many that is why that happens that way because it's mm -hmm. not one it's like a it's like a parasitic process same deal same deal yeah, just on a spiritual level you exactly. couldn't actually physically see it so when you watch uh like the omen or any movies like that when you watch uh, supernatural films what do you think I'm Monday morning quarterback way too much. I'd imagine, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, there's some shows that I think are really cool. I like Supernatural, the TV show. That's okay. fun. It's a fun show yeah. to watch. And whoever does the background research actually does a pretty decent job on giving, like, the background on all the stuff, okay? It takes a kind of fun turn to it that I can just sit back and enjoy. But um, – What about, know, like, paranormal activity, that, that kind of stuff? Because I enjoyed the first two. I thought they were pretty they're good. They're interesting and um, in, in their own way, but – Have you experienced – any such not like yourself personally but okay so do like the spirits grab you do they do they like pull on you or push you or anything like that or is it more of you just hearing them um sometimes they'll touch you sometimes they'll poke at you they can shove you okay i've been punched and like it hurt physically hurt physically i've had hurt. bruises now have you ever had a situation like a paranormal activity where like a family or whoever is getting ripped out of their beds and and that sort of stuff happening or I is had that blankets, more just movies blankets ripped off of beds um pinned down i actually just did a case a couple months ago where there were two girls and the one girl was being pinned down in her bed by something two black shadow figures one would stand beside the bed and watch any other she could feel its hands on her shoulders and pushing her down into the wow. bed and she couldn't get up she couldn't scream um so my stepmom has said about that before about having that she called it the heavies mm -hmm. um I, and then I've heard about that as well. I'm sorry. You, no, I that's cut fine. your story off. Uh, they, I, I don't know where I heard this, but this is something I remember is that it was believed to be with some people. I mean, either it's a spirit or it's anxiety. There's something called the old hag syndrome, which is believed to be um, kind of a form of an anxiety. It's a waking par paralysis, paralysis, excuse me. Okay. Um, the old hag syndrome. It's called the old hag syndrome. <laughs> um, because they, people would talk about it, felt like something like an old hag was sitting on my chest or a, something like that. Okay. So that would have been in the 1700s, 1800s, and it was their explanation for it. Um, but, you know, this was a physical thing that physically was happening, and they were awake at the time it was happening. Um, so, you know, those kind of things happen, and it can get fairly aggressive. Yeah. 
it's not the norm and I'm really grateful for that but yeah and I know that's a possibility going in I know that you know I'm going to possibly piss them off and they might come after me a little because <laughs> they're usually not too happy to begin with and you're if, stepping in, in that space yeah <laughs> if I'm in that area yeah do they fight like do, do ghosts fight with other ghosts like are they like can they see each other and they're like talking back and forth like on like Gettysburg when there's yeah. where there's spirits everywhere are they communicating with one another again it comes back to perception is reality if they're in that narrow tunnel of their trauma probably not yeah but if they're not yeah sometimes they can okay like if, and I guess if the trauma happened to both of them they would be connected. The, and that can, yeah, because they're all in that same field. Like if you have three, like there's three soldiers I know of that haunt a specific spot um, because they died there together. And, and so they seem to interact. Um, but then there's others, like I said, there's 14 levels and there's others that are interactive and conscious and they, they know that they're dead and they can look around and see the other spirits that are around them. Mm -hmm. So it depends. It's perception is reality. Do you think they're on a different, like, is it a frequency, like a wavelength? Uh, you know how you, you can't see cell phone signals, but right. th there's, there's something there, obviously. So is it like a different frequency Frequency we just don't know how to quite tap into? Or is it like a, a different universe, like a parallel universe kind of thing? Or what do you... I don't honestly have an answer, except I can tell you this much. I have to slow down mentally to catch them. Mark and I have talked about this at length. Um... And I would give you a couple really – the skull experiment being a really interesting experiment in England. And actually there's some videos that are out there on YouTube from the actual experiments. Um, so I think it is a frequency issue at some, at some level because I literally have to slow down. If I'm thinking and moving fast in my head, I can't catch them. I have to – and you'll see me – I'll sit there and I'll just kind of like, I got to calm down. I got to slow down. I got to slow down and make myself – go to that level where I can sign, sort of hear them and feel them. And then I'll start to tune in on them, and then it gets a little easier the longer I'm there. And then they're like, oh, she wants to talk now. So now I'm going to try to con make that connect. And uh, do you have a way of practicing that, like to get yourself? Do you meditate or anything to practice to get yourself to that state faster? I used to. I mean, I do meditate, because, uh, and I, but I meditate for a different reason. Like, well, I think people have a really bad perception of the word meditate. Uh, they think of it, and it's not that there's anything wrong with it, but they think of it as New Agey or Middle, um, Mideastern or something like that. Um, and the best way to explain meditation and prayer is prayer is whenever we talk to God. Meditation is when God talks to us. Mm -hmm. So I do that slowing down process and try to allow to hear yeah, put the brakes on a little bit. Yeah, and I think everybody should try that. It's it's really amazing how hard it is to do five minutes of that. Yeah, I've I've been meditating for three years, and it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, from where you start and you're panicking after a minute and a half in, like yes. how long's it been? <laughs> to you know, half an hour, forty minutes can go by, and you really are quite all right with that. It yes, depends on the mind state you're in, definitely. But in the morning, I always find it's much easier than in the evening. Because you've you got can, so much cluttered by then. Yeah, so much information flying through your head. Uh, but I would imagine that would help with being able to tap into that realm because you've got to slow the 70,000 thoughts you have in your head a day yeah. down or whatever, whatever the number is. You just, you have to, and I, I tend to rub my hands across. I know it's almost like I feel like I'm dirty or something. I got to get that off and just like let them talk and I'll just sit there quietly and wait mm -hmm. and then there they are so with this with the idea of the show starting with everything you've already done you've written how many books uh, about 23 23 books Today. that's a lot of books uh what do you like what's your vision for the future with this whole thing because obviously it's a phenomenon you know and, and it's only going to get more um, it's going to only get the sci-fi network. I mean, we have a whole network dedicated to this right. sort of stuff. So where do you, where do you want to go with what you're doing? Or do you just want to keep helping people throughout your life? That's the point of the whole thing. I mean, Kenny and I talked about it up front. The people we've been talking to have talked about it. Um, and all of us seem to be on the same page. And this is the blessing of the whole thing is if it does happen, it is about educating. It's about giving answers. It's about saying there is hope. Mm -hmm. Um, at the end of the day, I want to get the message out there that there are ways to get help, that there is help out there, that you're not completely alone, that there are a lot of answers that are not mainstream, but they're answers anyway, and they're real answers that can help. So at the end of the day, I don't really want pea soup floating around. I want to talk about what happens to real life people and how, how do you find help when you feel like the world's closed in and there's nowhere to go. 
what do you recommend to people who they're not sure where to start, right? Maybe they're not sure, maybe in their own head, they're like, am I crazy? Do I have a multi-personality disorder? Am I bipolar or am I possessed? Or what, what's the first steps they should take? Should they go the medicinal doctor route or should they go uh, your route or... I really have to tell you, my experience has been, I remember, because I work in the field of psychology, and I kept the two worlds completely separate in the beginning, okay? And I remember the f- second year I was at my com- the company I worked at, and I was at a staff meeting, and one of the therapists walked in and said, hey, are you the lady who does the ghost books? And I remember the very thought, as I hung my head, I literally dropped my head, and I thought, oh, shit, I love this job. I really did love this job. <laughs> She's done. <laughs> We're going to have to escort you out of here. Yeah, pretty much. And that's what I was afraid of and why I had kept it all so quiet. And um, I said, kind of winced and said, yeah, that would be me. And he's like, that is so cool. Do you know? And he starts telling me. So I have found that the in the, the therapeutic field, I'm sure there's closed-minded people, but most of them are I think are fairly people open. are much more open-minded now than yeah. they used to be. Because of all the ghost shows and the movies and everything, So I would say, you know, go to a decent, open-minded therapist who's willing to help you. And then from there, people stumble into me. And it's amazing to me how that happens. Literally... A friend of a friend of a friend says, hey, I know that lady. Let me call her and see what she says. I actually literally have a phone number somebody sent me today and said, hey, I don't think it's anything bad, but there's something going on in this house. And, well, they got little kids, so we should check it out. So I'll make a phone call later today and talk to the lady and see where we need to go from there. Every once in a while, we have a house from the 20s. I think it was built in 26. And uh, every once in a while, we'll go upstairs and it'll smell like cigarette smoke. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I've ever... I've ever experienced. I'm like, what is that smell? Like, it smells like smoke up here. Why would it be? Who's smoking? Like, nobody would be smoking cigarettes. We don't smoke. And I and then one day I was like, maybe that's a spirit. I don't know. Right. I mean, who knows? Well, I mean, it's just very odd that, that I've experienced that a bunch that, of different that times. That ghosts are always physically seen, but you know, there's all kind. There's there's like clairaudience, clairsentience. There's all kinds of different forms of it. Um, and smell is one of the ways you can experience. You hear people talk about, I smell my mother's perfume quite yeah. frequently. I know my grandmother's here because I always smell the scent she always wore. Things like that. Or my grandfather smoked a cigar. God, awful cigar. So I know he's there when I smell that smell. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just another part of the puzzle. That's so interesting. Um, okay. Well, uh, I guess I have one more question. You mentioned earlier uh about the 1800s and that being like a was that like a revolution for like ghosts spiritualism, or spiritualism? You mean? Okay, um so. yeah at, at the time of the civil war because there were so many people who were, had gotten um loved ones who died and they lost touch and there are a lot of people that just disappeared because a cannonball can vaporize you and right. nobody ever tells you anybody, you know, that so and so died. That you know, if you go back and look at Civil War, War rosters, missing, presumed dead after Battle of Gettysburg. You know, they don't have the faintest clue what happened to this person yeah, for you're real. Not tallying up all that. Um, and there it, wasn't forensics to go over and fingerprint exactly. people. Exactly. Um, so, a lot of people were trying to find a way to cope with that loss, and there was a lot of ghostly things happening you'll see that increase every time there's a war whether it's the civil war world war one world war two vietnam korea whatever it is um you'll hear the stories of people who died and at that moment appear at their mother's bedside or their wife's bedside or whatever so it was kind of a a double-edged thing going on and at the same time the concept of spiritualism of being able to communicate with the dead in other words i can talk to my son who disappeared i can get answers became a part of it. And I think about that because I'm a mom. What would I do if my son just disappeared one day? Now, naturally, some people use that as a a platform to make some money. Oh, my God, yes. There was a lot of fraud, a ton of it. Probably a little bit of truth, like 99% fraud, 1% truth. (laughs) And I think that's the way (laughs) it is with a lot of this, even today. um, You know, there are some really decent people, and I know some, who work in this field quietly, obscurely, um, under the radar, and mostly I'm under the radar, um, and I'm graced with being allowed to work with these people. Um, but then there are the, sh- the the people who make a fortune at it, and anybody who says it ev- and every time they come out the gate, they're going to be perfect, they're going to get it, blah blah blah. I'm always skeptical. You got to be right because it's not that good. I'm not that good. I don't know anybody that good in real life. And you have a you have a skill. You you have a special skill, and you're not even. 
catching I mean, that as they do on those shows all the time. No, I mean, like, I will tell somebody if I have to do a read for them, I need a personal object of that person in a picture, please. Mm -hmm. And I'll do the best I can. But I'm always walking through the dark and trying to figure this out. And I have to try to suspend my thought process. So it might be completely different. For example, I might see, like, I had a case where I saw a young man committed suicide or was playing Russian roulette. The question his mother wanted to have an answer to was, which was it? Because she was Catholic, and so if he committed suicide, he's not going to heaven. If it was in kind of an accident, he had a shot. Pardon the terrible pun. I just realized. That was. I apologize. <laughs> well done. <laughs> that was awful. Well. <laughs> um, anyway, so like the week before I was to do this, I started seeing this young man in a, a Korean era army jacket holding a gun he never looked at me he would just appear out of nowhere and say i can't cross over and then he would disappear and i thought oh my gosh that must be the boy and so i'm totally prepared for when i get to this house to see this boy's face in that picture it wasn't at all and i couldn't figure this out mm -hmm. so i'm trying to put my perspective on it yeah and i go ahead i do get a hold of the boy we do go through the process she does get her answers and they were she found some peace which was the purpose of my coming in the first place thank thankfully and um i still don't have the faintest clue who this boy is another two weeks go by and i'm driving somewhere and i hear a voice in the back seat and it says my name is donnie d-o-n-n-y and i can't cross over and I think, oh, crap, I know this voice. <laughs> and I look behind me, and he's sitting there looking straight ahead. And just behind me is a friend of mine who's also psychic, and she calls me, and she said, and we're going to a site. So she's following me to the site, and she says, uh, that boy you told me about? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, was he in your car just now because, and she's just like, because I'm bawling, and Charlie's bawling, and, like, we, we can feel this energy. And I'm like, yeah. So... It turned out it was actually for her brother, who was a Vietnam veteran, and um, wow. there was a whole comp there was a whole story, and we actually pulled over and allowed the two of them to talk. And it turned out the reason he couldn't go over, and why he was there for this boy, this young man, or this man David, we would not find that out for yet another three or four weeks. And it was that David was facing cancer, and he had come back. I can't cross over because he was waiting for David. Now, David didn't die, but he told me later, he said, I saw him quite frequently. And I, he said he gave me strength. He was there to support wow. his friend that he had been in the war with. And he died in the war, but David survived. Wow. But I, it was a totally different story than I ever anticipated. I could never have seen that coming. Yeah, that was not the plan. Yeah, it was like going straight forward and then to the right. <laughs> and so you That's sit there a lot wild. of the time just waiting because you can't ever figure out where they're headed. Yeah. Man, this is fascinating. I would. I need to read some of your books. Get more involved. I would love that. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you have anything that you wanted to talk about while you were here? Um, other than, uh, well, first of all, if you're interested in the subject and you want to either learn more about it or you want to share or talk or reach me, I have a Facebook page and um, we also have a page um, called the Paranormal Asylum, and it is a place where people give, share, communicate openly and freely on the subject respectfully so i invite anybody who wants to learn more or they have something they want to share to come you're more than welcome um is the your facebook page is patty wilson patty a wilson and then there's also and then there's the facebook page of paranormal, paranormal asylum. asylum okay and um and as far as buying your books amazon is there like a certain place they, they just search your name or? search my name on amazon uh they're yeah. in the bookstores now three of the books are going to be released next year uh re-released uh haunted pennsylvania haunted west virginia and haunted north carolina but they'll have new content we're going they're actually the publishing house has uh, decided to refurbish the books, update them, add new stories, and put whole new covers to them. So we're really excited about all that. Um, and we're working on a couple other projects with the publishing house. Uh, so, you know, just go check it out and what have you. But if you need help and you, and you need me, just go find me. I'll, um, there's a way to get me. I'm pretty easy to find. And, you know, let me know what you need it is. And if I can help you or if I can't help you, I might find somebody who's able to help you. Because at the end of the day, for me, it's not about validation anymore. And it's not about getting the EVP. It's about bringing peace to people who need it. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, it was all about well, when you making began, sure your 
you're not crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, at the like, beginning, you, you, you want that validation. You need that validation. Yeah. And then as you, like anything else in life, you grow and you mature and you go, how many more EVPs do I really need? Yeah. Does it matter? Compared to the amount of people that I've helped. Yeah, does it matter? Yeah. Well, if you want to get that check, it does. If you want to <laughs> get the TV deal. <laughs> so, you know, it is, it is it what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And, and you're right. That's whatever, whatever your thing is in life, the purpose is to help other people with it. So yeah. that's what you're doing. As, and Alive I do it, and dead. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's, it's that simple or making sense out of it. Mm. Maybe they're going to cohabit the living and the dead. Just let's make it easier on y'all. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Patty Wilson, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I've had a blast. I'd like to have you on again like around you know Halloween, October time. I would love that. That'd and be I'd be perfect. more than happy to do that. Cool. Wow, Patty, what an awesome time. And uh, Patty, I, I honestly really do think that you would enjoy Trade Secrets. You, you seem like you take the holistic approach to things. Uh, maybe check it out. Trade, Trade Secrets, 1223 13th Avenue in Altoona. Uh, that's Secrets in Trade on Facebook. Trade Secrets underscore skincare on Instagram. So uh, at Trade Secrets, Steph and her husband, Andy, sell all natural body care products. But the awesome part is they make them all in-house. So all in-house research. All in-house development, sugar scrubs, bath bars. My wife loves the all-natural deodorants because she has, like, some allergic reactions. Allergic reactions to, like, you know, regular deodorants. I didn't know that, like, Old Spice has aluminum in it. Did anybody else know that? Nobody's telling me these things. So I I go to Trade Secrets to get uh, my deodorant, uh, to get bath bombs for my son and my wife, body lotions, candles, whip body butters. They have it all at Trade Secrets, 1223 13th Avenue in Altoona. If you're not from the area and you want to find out what they have, Trade Secrets on Facebook. And also a shout-out, I'm sorry, Secrets in Trade on Facebook. And a shout-out to Sports Evolution, where I take uh, Gracie Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu from Mr. Alan Coble, my dude. I've been trying to get him on this podcast for a long time. And it's going to happen one of these days. But uh, he's a purple belt in Jiu-Jitsu, qualified certified in CrossFit levels one and two. He's an NSCA certified strength and conditioning specialist, certified personal trainer. He has his bachelor's in physical education and sports science. He teaches jujitsu, youth martial arts, teaches CrossFit. He does a lot. He does it all. And he can fix your body too if your body's broken. If it's beat up, Alan's the dude to go to. Sports Evolution, 2900 Plank Road in Altoona at Sports Evolution. Dot net Facebook and Instagram is leading athletes. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you so much for listening, for tuning in, for engaging in what I do. If you don't know, I give away free prizes on my Facebook, which is Rob Z Radio. So every Friday, I give away free stuff. If you love these podcasts, but you want to see what they actually look like, I have live videos for most episodes now. I didn't back in the day, but I do now have live episodes on Facebook Live. That's Rob Z Radio. So if you want to get a visual for what you're listening to, go there. Uh, my YouTube, which I'm, I'm just launching and slacking on YouTube, is Rob Z Show. And shout out to my dude, Jake Over. Jake Over. It's the takeover on Rob Z Radio because he provi- provides all the beats for the show now. Okay, so Jake makes his own beats. He's a record producer. Uh, he's awesome at what he does. And I said, dude... I need some new I need some new music for the podcast. Can you hook me up? And he gave me all of these beats and said, dude, just give me a shout out and you can use whatever you want. So Jake over. Check him out. And thank you so much for tuning in, Zebras. I love you. Patreon.com forward slash Rob Z Radio. That's brutal. This is Rob Z Radio.